thinking a few moments ago, um, Powersville First Baptist is my home church. It's also the first church that I started ministry in. So at that time, we didn't even have a student ministry. And uh, Brian Hester came up and said, uh, Brother Brad, you want to work with our students? And I said, why in the world would I want to work with students? He said, well, you're the one that said you had a calling from the Lord. And I said, well, yeah, but, then, you know, it's like, like weightlifting or something, you know. And he said, I think you'd be a good influence. So, so uh, we prayed about it. And I said, yeah. And I'll never forget, I walked in and it was in a room with about that many chairs. And man, it was huge. There was four students there. And uh, you would have thought the world was there. And we took that ministry all over the world. And I just think it's neat, my first church and my first ministry is here with me on my 44th birthday, not my 50th. <laughs> As I come to the conclusion of my first year here with the Del Norte Baptist Church family, I love you. Thank you. You're turning your Bibles this morning to Acts. Acts 4. I started ministry a little over 20 something years ago with Powersville First Baptist Church and, and I had this message that I wanted to get out. I had to get it out. And it's a message that I still preach to this day. And though we, we, uh, we bake the cake a whole lot of different ways, the main ingredient is always Jesus. It's always about the Lord. And I'm so happy to know that 20 years later uh, that I'm still just as excited about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ as I have ever been. Folks, I'm here to tell you, life is hard enough trying to do it by yourself. I can't imagine trying to live life without Jesus Christ in it. And when I walked in that room with those four students and three of the four, I had the opportunity to lead to the Lord um, in that ministry. And now they've grown up and they've got uh, kids of their own. And, um, and some of the, uh, my friends I went to church with, some of their kids are here this morning. And I'm telling you right now, the greatest message that we have to give today is the message of Jesus Christ. And our text today, we're looking at uh, Peter and John. They've been called in before the Sanhedrin, the, the leadership, uh, the, the religious and somewhat politi political leadership of that time for the Hebrews. And, and they're being charged with this one thing, speaking in the name of Jesus. They didn't like it. Now, these men couldn't deny the fact that something was taking place. And folks, we can't deny the fact that a little over 2,000 years later, since Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for each of us, something happened because we're here today. Christ made an impact that's still changing lives today. And just like then, so it is today, there's some that just don't like that. But folks, I'm telling you, and you've heard me say it many times, when the Holy Spirit is in your life, you can't hide the Holy Spirit. You just can't do it. When he's in there, he's always bursting to get out. I'll tell you the skit that y'all just did a little while ago. I've seen it um, a few other times, and I still get moved every time because I still remember the day that Christ stepped in and said, look, you're not going to touch him again. And I've been dancing with him ever since. I'm glad he's a whole lot better at it than I am. But Christ is amazing. And Peter and John couldn't deny this. So here we find them in front of the Sanhedrin. We find them, they're being, well, let's read the story. Verse 18, Acts 4, verse 18. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And then they had further, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people for all were praising God for what had happened. Let us pray. 
Father, I thank you for the text this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, how you're moving here at Del Norte. I thank you for the lives that are being changed, the families that are being restored. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your love is continually with us. And Father, I thank you that as we look this week and next week at understanding the message must get out. Lord, I pray that our greatest desire would be to let the world, to be to let the world know that you're the only thing that really matters. God, that we thank you for all things, but the greatest thanks we can give is for you. So Father, I pray that this message would empower us, convict us, encourage us. Lord, I pray as most often I do, I would be nothing but a broken vessel restored through the power of the Holy Spirit to simply preach your word. So Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts, both in this and all the services that are taking place here at Del Norte and around your land. And Lord, when the time comes for us to be obedient, I pray that if the Holy Spirit beckons us in any way, whatever he asks us to do, Father, that we would do so in a humble spirit. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. So what would really happen if we were like Peter and John? It says they couldn't deny it. Matter of fact, they, they were, they, the, all the people were praising God for what they'd seen when it had happened. What would happen if the world truly seen God's church praising his name in everything? So many times we just take life for granted and we take the things that God gives us for granted when the truth is the world ought to see us celebrating every moment. You know, I'm grateful to be here this morning. I'm 44 years old and after working at Enlow with Ira for a day, I feel like I'm 100. <laughs> it's amazing. You can go in a beautiful land and, and trees be everywhere and be like, there's really nothing to do. Give Ira a chainsaw. There will be something to do. But 44 years of walking with the Lord, and many of you have done it much longer than that. What would happen if the world saw us truly walking and praising? I think sometimes we worry more about what the world thinks, what a, I put it this way, a lost, dying creation feels, wants, and says more than the creator of the universe and what he feels, desires, and commands. Folks, we got to get to a point in our life that we understand one thing. You see, the battle here wasn't about them not speaking in Jesus. So I'm only going to get to the first part of my message today. We'll, we'll go to the next two next week. But the battle wasn't should, or, should they or should they not speak in Jesus' name. The battle was sovereignty. The battle that they were being challenged with is, was who was sovereign of their heart. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about today. The judgment was sovereign. The judgment was sovereign. What do I mean by that? Let's read verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Folks, God is sovereign. God must be the sovereign entity in our heart and in our life. You see, I, when I was talking about uh, the, the thing that was taking place here wasn't the fact that people were saying, you can't do this anymore. You can't speak in Jesus' name. And are we told that today? You can't speak in Jesus' name. Matter of fact, Pickens County, not too long ago, uh, they were challenged. I'm going to use another illustration later, but Pickens County was challenged. And they said, back where I live, and they said, you can't speak in Jesus' name. You can pray, but you can't just pray to God or, or Jesus. You just, but we, we will let you pray. This crazy little atheist group said, we will allow you to pray, but you can't pray in Jesus' name. Who are they to tell us who we can and can't pray to? And I was praying. I said, man, I hope Pickens County steps up. I hope they do the thing. And they voted 42 and they agree. We will continue to have prayer at our school board meetings, but we will not pray to an entity. And who are you praying to? They were being told they couldn't pray. Folks, do we listen to the media, a lost and dying world, countless false religions? Do we listen to lies and myths and bad theology? Or do we listen to the will of God? 
God's sovereign will. The disciples use the word right here, meaning equitable, by implication to be innocent or holy. They're clearly stating that whether they are measured by what is right in the eyes of man or God, the people must judge. But in their eyes, they're measured only by what God has said. My friends, there's going to come a point, and we, you've been, many of us my age and a little older, you've heard this for years. There's going to come a day. There's going to come a day. There's going to come a day. My friends, we are living in that day. And we're being told now, even as churches, that we can't even go out and, and have prayer. We can't even go out and, and encourage others. And you say, preacher, I haven't heard that. Well, you ought to go to me in the meetings I go to. And many times they say, Pastor Brad, and I have to turn them down. They say, would you be willing to come and to speak and to share? Yes, I'd love the opportunity to come do that. Great. We're so blessed to have you here. If you can just not speak about Jesus or God, we'd really appreciate it. What else is there to talk about? And that's exactly where Peter and Paul are here, but they use the word right here. You see, they knew they would be deemed innocent before a holy God when judgment is placed. Let's look at the word, ju um, the word judge here, meaning to distinguish or to decide. It, by implication, it means to try or condemn or to punish. They had already resolved in their heart, regardless of what these men decided would happen to them, they had already decided that they would rather have the judgment of God than the judgment of man. These men could have done horrible things to them. But they didn't care. Matter of fact, the scripture says they were bold. It says they were bold. They didn't stand there cowardly like little um, leaves going through the wind, afraid of where they might land. They stood there bold. Let's read the text. Acts 4.13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John... You see, when Christ is truly sovereign, when God is sovereign in your heart, you don't have a problem being bold. Now, I don't mean a boldness that's, that's uh, uh, mean or prideful or hurtful. But I'm talking about a boldness that when the world says, well, I think this, and you don't need to speak. You said, look, I'm not trying to be mean to you, but there's one that needs to be heard, and I'm the voice of God Almighty, Jesus Christ. And he says... And then we give the word of God. I don't understand why we cower down when God gives us the ability to be bold. Matter of fact, they understood it was better to fear God than to fear man. We get that from Matthew 10 and 28. These men had walked with Jesus and Jesus said, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I've been told when I went to my last church, I was uh, told, you know, uh, preacher, you need to be careful now how you preach. Because, you know, it might not go well. You got to realize we don't live in the day that we used to live in. Now, this was in South Carolina. And folks, you need to understand, when I came to New Mexico, I had all types of friends from all over the nation calling. I said, now, Brad, you better not preach the way you did back in South Carolina. Boy, they'll run you out of that state. Well, run me out. I got a mama who loved to help me. She, she was on the phone a little while ago just to cry. My little baby boy is 44 years old. I said, yeah, mama, you're getting old, baby. <laughs> Folks, we can't help but share what we've seen and heard. We'll talk about that next week. We can't help but talk about what we know to be true. But here we understand that they were going to be threatened. Look what it says in verses 17 and 21. So the world loves to threaten. But in order that they, might not, that they may not spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name, Jesus' name, verse 21. And when they had further threatened them. I reckon you, Mr. Warner. I am fighting a sinus infection, my friends, and I'm here to tell you. Though I have th great faith that I'm going to win right now, I don't feel like I'm winning much. 
You see, God's sovereignty is never threatened. God's sovereignty is never threatened. When the world says, you can't do this, do you think God goes, shrieks, oh my goodness. Folks, my friend, God's sovereignty is never threatened in the sense that God will do whatever he feels he should do because it's his will. Matter of fact, let's look at these words, warned and threatened. They both mean the same thing, forbid. They forbid them to speak about Jesus. Now look, we love, I, I'm here to tell you, we love as a Christian, uh, I would say Christian nation, but as a Christian nation in the church. America is no longer a Christian nation. But as a Christian nation in church, we love to use the excuse, well, preacher, you know, I'd really love to let the world see that Christ changed my life, but they tell me I can't do that. Folks, you can live for Christ and share his word without saying a word sometimes. You can live for Christ, but yet we want to fall back and cower away. Well, they said I couldn't, but God said you could. You can stand up and speak up anytime you desire for Jesus Christ. It just takes the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to stand up and speak up. The reason many don't, I wonder, I wonder if they have the Holy Spirit in their life. You see, not too long ago, here's where we are as many Christians. The atheist group that challenged Pickens County, they first went to Oconee County School Board and they challenged them. He, they, they told him, they said, look, you got to stop doing this. So the board said, we're going to have a night where we're going to let people come and, and give the reasons why we should be able to pray and reasons why we shouldn't be able to pray. Three showed up for prayer and support. The only reason there wasn't four was because I was a mission trip, on a mission trip with my church. Three showed up. And then this atheist group come up and they said, you need to know something. If you continue to do this, we will financially bankrupt you. We will smear you across this nation. We will make you the example of what other school boards will have to deal with. You don't want to mess with us. And that's the tone they used. And you know what Oconee County decided to do? Well, seeing how only three people showed up for support, they said, apparently, it's not that important. So now, Open Oconee County no longer has prayer. And their school board meeting, she said, Pastor, is that a big deal? I don't know. Where are, what do our schools look like today? Seems like the more we try to push every generation away from God, the worse we become. Boy, we're, we're smart, aren't we? we smart folks, aren't we? Oh, so let me tell you something. Without God, there, 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 there's no need to even be here today. And yet we want to compartmentalize. Folks, God either gets it all or he gets nothing. And God will not be threatened. First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above all. What would happen if Christ truly became the head of the church again? But when did he stop? I don't know. But it happened somewhere. Somewhere we lost our fight. Somewhere we began to think that people outside of a walk with God have more knowledge than those that are inside of a relationship and walk with God. And we began to think it's okay. Well, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to do anything that might bring people to Jesus. Folks, let me tell you something. It's time to stop listening to the threats. I've been sued. I've been threatened. I've been told for years. That's why I have such a strong resolve. That's why when people come to me this day and they say, well, now, preacher, if, 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 you, uh, if you preach on Jesus and you talk about his name, you need to understand something. Let me tell you something. I've heard buying goats and barking dogs before, and you don't deal with them. You just walk away. They're just threatening. 
Well, Pastor, what happens if they take your life one day? Then they take my life. Well, it's easy to say. Let me say this. Then they take my life because it was not mine to start with. I gave it up the day I accepted Christ. If we do not stop listening to the threats and the warnings of the world, we're going to continue to diminish and influence ministry and evangelism. Look at these. I've got them up on the uh, PowerPoint for you to write down if you want. The church will never share a message that it does not believe in. And the church will never stand on a word that it does not have faith in. And the church will never place sovereignty in a God that it does not trust in. Which church are we? And if you're a part of God's church, then how or do you truly believe and have faith and trust? Or you, do you question? You see, we've come to a time and place where sacrifice is needed. We can't just flippantly think that everything's going to be okay because it's not. No one's looking out for your faith and your family unless it's you and you alone. Folks, we've, we've given our children and grandchildren nothing. And we've stole from them the hope that they were supposed to have. I remember going in and getting on the bike and riding around the block when I was seven or eight years old. And the only thing I heard my mama say, she didn't say, well, be careful and don't take candy from strangers. She didn't say that. She said, just be home by six. That's all. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I live in a, in a, in a safe neighborhood. My boys are, are 14 and 16 years old. And I still have reservations with letting them get on the bike and just riding around the neighborhood. Why? Because this is the world we live in. And we've stolen safety from our own kids. Because somewhere we gave in to the threats and the lies. You see, the judgment of the sovereignty here, we end with this. God's sovereignty always reveals truth. God's sovereignty always reveals truth. I put it this way. All this confusion could have been avoided with Peter and John. All this hurt and distraction could have been avoided. All they had to do was do a simple investigation. All they had to do was follow the evidence, follow the facts. That's all they had to do. None of this would have happened. But the world then, just like today, they don't want to follow the truth. They don't want to follow the evidence. They don't want to follow the facts because they know what would happen. There, there's people in this place today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have no clue what I'm talking about. But you've heard it your entire life. And you, and, and you simply need to just follow the facts and the evidence. You see, let's look what would take place. What would have it led to? Let's read verses 13 through 16 again. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. <laughs> You can't argue with truth. You need to understand this man had been a cripple for over 40 years of his life. Everyone around there knew that this man was a real, this wasn't some TV evangelist that bustles them in and walks them in through the back and they got a script to follow. This was a true, true disabled individual and Christ healed him. Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, listen to this, they conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we cannot deny this. You see, you can't deny the fact that Christ was sovereign in this fact that he healed this man. And even those that didn't want to believe it had to. The last thing these men wanted to do was to, give, was to give Christ any credibility. But see, the point is, they, had already, they already knew that Christ was alive and well. 
They knew that Christ was risen from the grave. If you want to turn there, you can, but I'm going to read this to you. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. When they were going, behold, some of the guard, these are the guards that were guarding Jesus' tomb. Some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while he, while he was asleep. Now I went on a Wednesday night and told you why that was impossible. Well, preacher, it probably wasn't impossible. It was impossible. There's no way they could have done it. A bunch of scared, cowardly men going up against some battle armed soldiers that were looking for a fight. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. They'll bribe the governor. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. You said, Pastor, why is that important? Just follow the evidence. You see, these men knew that Jesus was alive and well. Now you have two men coming up a little bit later and they're speaking and preaching in the name of Jesus. So much so that people are being healed in the name of Jesus. All they had to do was follow the evidence. These were the men. These were the religious scholars of their day, the brightest of the bright. And they had heard where Jesus was, was resurrected. They had testimony from their own guard. And now they have men preaching in the name of Jesus. People are giving their faith in the name of Jesus and people being healed in the name of Jesus. And what do these men do? They still want what they want. They didn't want to give up their personal sovereignty. They didn't want to give up their right to be in control. It says in John 11, here's text to prove this. John 11, 47 and 48. So the chief priest came and the Pharisees gathered and ca- gathered the council and said, what are we to do? And listen to this, for this man talking about Jesus performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, talking about Jesus, everyone will believe in him, listen to this, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. We won't be important anymore. We won't matter anymore. It'll be all about Jesus. You see, God's sovereignty always reveals the truth and the truth is, and the truth is, is we need Jesus. And somewhere along the way, as a church, as the church of the United, in, in the United States of America for Christ, we, we kind of forgot that God's going to do what God's going to do. And we can either be a part of it or we can be like these men or be against it. Are you a part of it or against it? You see, I believe this morning there's some that need to come before a holy altar and just get down on their knees and say, God, you're sovereign. You're sovereign. I'm not going to debate this with you. I'm not going to argue this with you. I, I, it's not about me. I, I'll be honest with you, folks. I... I enjoy fellowship. I enjoy going up to Inlow. But if you think getting on my hands and knees and fixing a lawnmower for the third time, I don't get on my knees and go, I'm just thanking Jesus that this blade keeps falling off. I'm, I'm thanking Jesus that this belt keeps falling off and the engineers decided to make it totally miserable to put it back on. I did it because God is sovereign. And he said, I need help here. Will you come and help? And I said, I will do whatever I need to do. I got so frustrated with that lot more. I, I just told, I told Josiah, I said, Joe, just go put, just, just put the thing back in the lawn. I don't, I don't want to touch that lawnmower again. Stupid lawnmower. About to sacrifice it. Walking with Jesus doesn't mean everything you do is fun or exciting. It just simply means he's sovereign and you follow I've had to deal with many conversations, many meetings. I've been called many names. I've been mocked by many. It doesn't mean I enjoyed it. It just means God is sovereign and he's going to do what he does. I'm asking you this morning, are there some in here, truly you have a walk with the Lord, but somewhere along the line, 
he wasn't truly sovereign. Or maybe this morning you're like these. I won't be in control anymore and you just need to give it up and let God be in control of your life. Well, pastor, how do things work out? I don't know. I'm standing in a land I've never been in a church I never knew existed. With the first ministry I was ever a part of. Celebrating the first year of ministry with people I'm just getting to know over 20 years later. And none of that was planned. Except for God. Maybe you don't need to be in control. Maybe you just need to let God be sovereign in your life and let him bless you and work in you. And then see where it goes. Maybe you'll be up on top of a mountain fixing a lawnmower. I don't know. Maybe you'll stand in front of many with some of the best friends you've ever had in your life preaching God's word. But I'm telling you, it's worth it if you let God be sovereign. You'll never, ever be able to share the message of Jesus Christ. I, I close with this statement. You'll never, ever, listen to this, share the word of Jesus Christ honestly and truthfully if he's not sovereign. He must be sovereign.